It's a great pleasure uh, to announce today's speaker, Pete Westover. I have about a 15-page introduction, but I'll cut it down. Pete's done a lot of interesting things. Um, I first met Pete a good number of years ago. We were trying to figure out how long ago. We had, can't, can't figure it out. I have to look it up. But a while back, we were both on the Massachusetts Board of the Conservation Law Foundation in Boston, um, which if you don't know about that organization, actually, they're really great, and they're really great people, and they do great work. You can look at their website, www.clf.org. Um, it's a really interesting website. Anyway, Pete does a lot of things related to environmental issues. Not only is he an active board member uh, on for CLF, but about 15 years ago, he founded his own environmental um, consulting firm called Conservation Works, uh, which deals with a variety of issues, uh, including land management, land protection, uh, various uh, biological services, uh, developments. He's involved in developing trail systems on protected lands. Um, he's got a BS degree from Oberlin College and a graduate degree from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Yay. And he's taught uh, a variety of courses, including forest, forest management courses at uh, Antioch Graduate School. He's the author of a number of books, including a book about uh, birding in western Massachusetts and another book on the history of farming um, in Amherst since, uh, I think, the year 1700 is when the book starts. All right. um, anyway, he's got uh, a whole a bunch of awards uh, for his conservation work. Uh, but he also teaches courses as an adjunct professor at Hampshire College in ecology, including a course on land conservation and um, uh, ecology and culture of northern uh, Costa Rica. And the Colonorians would be interested in that. Um, he's done a lot of work on conservation issues with a, a variety of uh, Native American groups as well. And uh, that's what he's going to be talking about today. So please join me in welcoming him aboard, Pete Westover. Thanks, Jim. I got you. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, thanks. It's great to meet everybody. This is, this is a nice turnout. Um, so I'm going to try to cover a number of things, probably, probably too much in the time we have available, but uh, some words about land conservation, climate change, uh, some of the things that uh, indigenous groups are doing around the state. Uh, I've had the privilege of, of working with uh, a, a few of the tribes on land issues, and I approach this from a non-native perspective, and so I don't presume to talk for native folks. And I understand that Ramona Peters might be listening in. I hope so. Uh, Ramona is uh, out on the Cape and was the instigator for uh, the what's called the Native Land Conservancy. Any of you familiar with the NLC? Uh, that is the first uh, fully native-run land trust east of the Mississippi, and they've been doing some really neat stuff out uh, on the Cape and are in a position possibly to help tribes other than the Mashpee Wampanoag with land transactions. And one of the things that they've done recently, I'll get into this, but is to uh, be very creative about uh, approaches to land other than fee acquisitions so that one of their projects has been to come up with, in, in coordination with the Dennis Land Trust, what's called the Cultural Respect Agreement, which uh, focuses on 200 acres uh, of coastal land in, in Dennis and gives the native folks uh, the right to uh, perform, you know, carry out various ceremonies and otherwise use and manage the land. So, uh, one of the things I, I want to focus on today is the, the wide range of possibilities there are uh, in terms of native reclaiming of land which has been taken from them over centuries. But let me start. So uh, Connecticut River is where I'm based. We have six people in our firm and we work all over New England, but we're lucky enough to work right here, and I've, what I've been doing for the last 40 years or so is all in the conservation movement with land trust. As you may know, the uh, Mass Land Trust Coalition had its conference this last weekend. I think there are 130 land trusts in the state, so there's a lot of activity going on. 
and uh, there are uh, there's a lot of possibility for partnerships with various uh, uh, environmental justice groups with indigenous tribes and so forth. So I want to talk a little about that. So let me see if I can. Okay, so looking at our valley, we've got a lot of great farmland. We've got the river. We've also got, uh, believe it or not, real air quality issues. So one of the things we've done recently is uh, tried to focus on environmental justice issues. Uh, I spend a lot of time in the, in the city of Springfield. Springfield and Holyoke, I think I have a picture. Um, oh, okay, so here's open space. As you can see, there's a, a network of protected land on the map on the left that uh, has involved lots and lots of different parties and tons of effort and tons of money but realistically, this has been a very white movement, and that's the history of conservation around the, around the country. I mean, starting with Yellowstone Park, which was set up by virtue of expelling thousands of native citizens from the Yellowstone area. So uh, what our hope is, among other things, is broadening the conversation that uh, these white groups largely white groups have been conducting to uh, get the perspective from residents who have been part of the picture for thousands of years. Uh, and then w w one thing we have done is work closely with Amherst College and with some other educational institutions in helping with habitat development and research on their lands and setting up their campus farm uh, I, my, my teaching at Hampshire uh, has uh, involved a, a good bit of um, interaction with indigenous folks. We have speakers coming in from, uh, from our area that uh, have an indigenous background, and it's been, it's been rewarding for the students. So... Um, in terms of climate change, I mean, there are two sides of the picture. One is reacting to what is obviously happening already, and I don't know whether you might be familiar with the MVP program. The state pays towns, and they're trying to get all 351 cities and towns involved to prepare resilience plans, adaptation plans, uh, to respond to all of the things that are happening in terms of climate change at a very local level. So we worked with the town of Deerfield, uh, preparing their plan, and we'll be working with, I think, some other towns. In, and, and what you see down here on the right is the Deerfield River uh, in, in flood. And uh, that was, I think, Hurricane Irene, which did a, a real number on a lot of New England. But there are, there are various steps that towns can be taking uh, to be ready for what is clearly going to be, you know, more and more dramatic effects of, from climate change. And then the state also pays for the follow-up you do the study, and then, well, what do you do about it? Do you implement it? Yes, there's implementation money, up to, I think, 150000 per town to do the things. Maybe, maybe it's uh, drainage control. Maybe it's better communications. Uh, a whole lot of things. Uh, farmland protection. So I mentioned uh, environmental justice and air quality. So uh, it turns out that Springfield and Holyoke are the two cities, uh, the worst cities in the country for asthma. And it's a really high percentage of students, you know, high school age, younger, that are suffering from asthma, partly because of the Mount Tom coal plant that operated right there by the river for a long time. It closed down a few years ago, partly uh, as a result of legal pressure put on by Conservation Law Foundation. They're, one of their projects was working with local um, groups, local nonprofits, to uh, focus on the air issues and to get, uh, you know, start thinking about reuse. And uh, CLF has a coal-free New England campaign that's been going on, and they've, they've been successful in closing some of the 
uh, some of the coal plants and are working on others. Uh, so uh, I mentioned environmental justice. We've got a series going on at Hampshire College and uh, the Hitchcock Center, and you might be aware of Hampshire's uh, current financial stress position, so we're hoping that they pull through. But um, among other people that have, have spoken as part of this is uh, Dorsita Taylor. Any of you heard Dor Dorsita Taylor? University of Michigan. She has done uh, some terrific work uh, in focusing on uh, envi environmental groups, conservation groups around the country, and the fact that the diversity level is extremely low, uh, and focusing on how to remedy this and you know broaden broaden the discussion. Uh, a lot of great research which she presented. Okay, so Springfield. One of the reasons the air quality is uh, is poor, at least at part of the year is the I-91 corridor, which runs right along the edge of Springfield. Uh, there is a regreening Springfield effort that's going on in, connect, in, in coordination with the U.S. Forest Service and with a lot of the nonprofits. Uh, there is, uh, and that involves tree planting, that involves, um, you know, or galvanizing parts of the communities within Springfield to uh, do various conservation projects. And I think, I think that, that's hopeful. We're, we're also looking at the site of the casino, which is right, right there by the river. And who knows what the future is going to be. Springfield doesn't have a plan B right now, so we've got the, we've got the casino. Um, and one of the, one of the uh, issues has been whether or not uh, Palmer Renewable Energy would be allowed to proceed with the development of a big biomass plant in East Springfield. Uh, which undoubtedly would uh, worsen the air quality, and uh, it's been it's been contested by uh, you know, most of the environmental groups in our area. There's Climate Justice Coalition. There's Arise for Social Justice, which is a really it's a it's, you know they operate out of a little storefront, but they've got so many people involved at at the very grassroots level. Uh, we've we've been meeting with the folks from Arise. You know, you go in there; they have a sign on the wall that says, "If you're here to help, we're not interested. If you're here to be part of the struggle that we've been going through for quite a while, come in and talk." You know, um, and I think the the, um, the 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 big umbrella that they cast is is quite impressive. They've been fighting some of the pipeline projects. And of course, everybody's aware of the, uh, the you know the Standing Rock pipeline issues, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But one of the things we hear from uh, Native folks is that, well, great, a lot of people got involved in the Standing Rock pipeline issue, but where were they when you know as we've been facing so many other land-related issues? So maybe maybe you'll see you know more galvanizing of the kind of support that really is needed. So here's here's my class at uh, uh, the last class I taught at Hampshire, and uh, we we've we've had some some great discussions about uh, land issues. And I think as as you look broadly, one of the challenges is how to get more land into back where the, where it belongs into the hands of indigenous groups. So we'll talk about that. Um, th we we had, we did a good bit of reading in Sacred Ecology. How many of you are have, are aware of Fickred Burks's book called Sacred Ecology? Uh, it should be required reading. It's traditional ecological knowledge um, in a in a fascinating way. He spent years he, University of Manitoba. He spent years uh, looking into uh, cultural. Uh, fishing practices among the Cree and other Indian groups in Canada, as they call them First Nation groups. And um, uh, I'll mention later that we were lucky enough, uh, uh, another professor and I took six students up to Cree Indian country, First Nation country near James Bay last year and got a, a very, uh, you know, fascinating. Uh, perspective on the, the kind of 
uh, cultural issues and subsistence issues and land issues that Pickford Burks talks about because we stayed with a, uh, a Cree family in a hunting camp for a good while. So uh, in our valley, we, we've had a, a lot of interesting conversations developing, and one of them is going on this afternoon and tomorrow, and that is the Five College Native American and Indigenous Studies Symposium. This is an annual thing. We, a, couple, a couple years ago, we focused on traditional ecological knowledge. This time it's on uh, survivance, uh, resistance. And there, there are some great speakers coming in, um, all of them indigenous, I think. Uh, uh, Lisa Brooks is Abenaki. She's at Amherst College and uh, has gotten, uh, has recently written an award-winning book on the history of, of King Philip's War. Uh, Lisa has been very active with the Five College group and um, uh, has, has helped kind of galvanize a lot of these discussions. Oh, and I, meant, I should mention, uh, you may also be aware of the book called Captors and Captives about the uh, Deerfield Massacre of 1704, written by a Tufts professor, Evan Hypoli and uh, Kevin Sweeney of Amherst College. And then we've also got uh, two people coming in on April 10th as part of our environmental justice series. Nicole Friedrichs is the director of the Indigenous Rights Clinic at Suffolk Law School. And uh, she graduates, I was mentioning to Ninian's class earlier, she graduates half a dozen students every year who then go on to work directly with tribes, uh, representing them in front of uh, international tribunals. Uh, they've, they've been preparing a petition on behalf of the uh, Nipmuc and the Chappaquiddick Wampanoag to try again for recognition, uh, federal recognition, which they have been uh, rejected on so far. Um, and, uh, and then uh, Cedric Woods, who you see in the middle of the upper picture, is at UMass Boston, and he is the director of the Institute for uh, New England Native American Studies. He's uh, a member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina, but the two of them, uh, over the last several years, have coordinated a series of first, uh, what they call listening sessions, that have uh, involved a good many tribal leaders, uh, from around Massachusetts and beyond, and uh, fo focusing on land issues, focusing on mascots, focusing on a number of other uh, very important parts of uh, uh, you know the the discussion, and and then a series of working group meetings with the, the same uh, uh, tribal leaders and others. I think up to 70 at a time, uh, dividing up into groups and talking about uh, where they go from here and continuing these discussions. Uh, you may be aware of the, uh, the 2020, the Plymouth 400 <coughs> uh, celebration that's going to happen. And this time, the uh, uh, Native groups have made sure that they are going to be properly represented in the discussion. And there have been there, there's, a, there's a floating exhibit that came out to Amherst College uh, last year that's going to be part of this. And I think it's going to be moving around from place to place, uh, presented by uh, uh, Native folks. Um, uh, Paula Peters is a filmmaker who's, uh, I think, uh, Wampanoag, who's out, out on the Cape. And she has done, among other things, a really uh, cool little three-minute presentation. Uh, I, I wish I could show it to you. I don't think there's time, but uh, it is called The Messenger Runner. And, and what it does is follow a, uh, a young uh, Wampanoag uh, tribal person who you see, you see running through the various villages and parts of the Cape and finally gets to his destination with a message. And he holds up his cell phone and it says, we are still here. And that, that is the message. You know. Um, okay, so one of the concerns that has come up in, in our part of the country has been uh, the preservation of ceremonial stone landscapes. Uh, and there are, there are folks who are involved with, with uh, several of the tribes who have been helping pinpoint where these sites are and making sure that when there is work done, 
I mean, in this case, here was a trail construction project up in Northfield that we were involved with, and um, there were archaeological, there was archaeological information that indicated that uh, this had been either a women's gathering place, a native women's gathering place, or a, um, uh, in, in, some other, in some other way, a ceremonial spot. So how to build the trail without damaging the archaeological resources? And uh, uh, Elizabeth Perry, who's uh, one of the, uh, his, she's a historical officer for the, um, one of the, mass, the Wampanoag groups, came out and was good enough to actually walk along with the equipment and make sure that uh, proper respect was being shown to these cultural resources. Um, okay, so uh, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be able to work with uh, a few of the uh, native leaders on some, some land projects. Cheryl Holly on the right is the chief of the Hassanamisco Nipmuc tribe, which is focused in Grafton. And if you know anything about the Nipmuc, they used to um, uh, live and use uh, a live in and use a very large area of part of Rhode Island, part of Connecticut, up in through central Mass. And when the state passed its Enfranchisement and Allotment Act back in 1869, uh, the reservation that they had uh, at that point was broken up because what the Allotment Act did was get rid of communal land. Uh, so um, the, the Indian tribes Indian were, were no longer considered wards of the state. They were now citizens, but uh, without benefit of these common lands. So at that point, the, uh, the land went to, to individual Indians and then got, you know, for one reason or another, was sold off because I think the idea was almost intentionally that uh, debts would have to be paid and land would have to be sold. And so uh, we are now down to the point where there is only a little three and a half acre site that uh, the, the Nipmuc still control. And I'll show you a picture of some, the, the land there. Oh, and I should mention, so second from the left is Alma Gordon, whom I've also been lucky enough to work with on, uh, she's the chief of the Chappaquiddick Wampanoag, which is a tribe that has, it's, it's now landless, but it has been regenerating. And they, as of about 20 years ago, uh, a few of the key folks in the Chappaquiddick group have been uh, uh, successful in, in gathering many of the Chappaquiddick uh, Wampanoag folks who have been scattered and they are back to a point where they can focus on the possibility of acquiring land. Uh, you may be aware of the uh, re recent um, Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, uh, change in the, you know, enforced change in the status of the several hundred acres that has been in trust for the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Are people familiar with that situation? So the Mashpee Wampanoag uh, had a, more than 300 acres of land that's been in trust for some time, ever since they were given federal recognition. They're one of the recognized, federally recognized tribes. And um, the, the, the recent opinion was based on uh, the Carcieri uh, Supreme Court case, which said that uh, tribes that were not acknowledged before 1934, when the Indian Reorganization Act passed, are not eligible to have land added to them uh, and, and be held in trust by, by the United States. So uh, what, what that's done is changed the status back out of their control of the 300 acres plus, uh, they had uh, plans to build a casino in Taunton. I'm not sure, I think that's up in the air now. 
uh, and uh, they have lost the control of those 300 acres, which they depended on for various projects. I mean, they were planning to build elderly housing, to build some other commercial uh, projects. Uh, the, uh, an act uh, of uh, a, a U.S. bill to remedy that situation was filed last year. It didn't go anywhere, but Senator Markey is about to refile this year, and Representative Keating has already refiled. So this bill is going to be coming up. It's the, it's the bill to reaffirm the Mashpee Reservation, uh, Mashpee Wampanoag Reservation. So I hope people will pay attention to that and call Markey and put pressure on because this is, this is critical. So this is, this is an example of one of the, the projects that the Native Land Conservancy has, uh, has, has worked out. This was a, a gift of land that's um, right there on the Cape. And as I mentioned, I, I hope that the, the Conservancy will be in a position to possibly help other tribes uh, acquire land. Uh, among other uh, projects that are going on is the uh, establishment of what they call the uh, Wampanoag Canoe Passage, which is, I think it's 70 miles worth of waterways uh, down in the southeast that uh, the, the Mashpee Wampanoag have, have worked on with other groups. So uh, just a, kind of a broader perspective as, as we look at the potential for putting various combinations together to get land back into tribal control. Uh, one of the things I was lucky enough to do was to follow the 1100 mile Nez Perce Trail out from western, from eastern Oregon uh, and the Wallowa Valley, which you see right here. The, the Nez Perce, as you might know, in 1877 were forced off of their uh, traditional lands that they had occupied for thousands of years. I mean, this is salmon culture, this is agricultural culture, and uh, they were chased by the military for more than a thousand miles across major rivers, you know, with all hands. Started out with, I think, more than 800 plus, more than a thousand livestock, uh, all the way to um, Montana. Here's what the, uh, the Wallowa Valley looks like now. Uh, all the way to Bear Paw uh, Battlefield, which is where they were finally cornered and rounded up and then promised to uh, be allowed to return to their homeland. It never happened. They were forced all the way down to Kansas and then down to Oklahoma. Uh, most of their, uh, most if not all of the children in the group uh, perished. And they have been divided up between a, a reservation in Idaho and an, another multi-tribe reservation in Washington State ever since. Uh, they were allowed to move back, but not back to their homeland. So finally, a few years ago, uh, in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy, the Nez Perce have titled to a 10,000 acre ranch, and they are making that a base and a foothold so that they can then uh, reach out from there and, and add additional land. Here was the uh, marker the, uh, noting the death of one of their, their chief leaders. And then, as you find in so many situations, uh, because of the, uh, the effects of the Dawes Act, the, uh, the Allotment Act that passed in 1887, I think, uh, nationally, that um, fragmented it, it, it did the same thing the, the state act did. It took out of communal ownership um, uh, millions of acres of tribal land and uh, put it into private hands, private Indian hands, but then it got uh, uh, frittered away and, and lost. So you find these mixtures of, even on the reservations of ownership, a uh, very, very tangled picture. Okay, so uh, one of the things I realized as I looked into, we, at, the, at the National Land Trust Conference, uh, Valentin Lopez, whom you see on the far right, is uh, lower right, is the chief of the Amamutsan tribe in California. 
and um, they are survivors of the genocide that took place in California from 1840, roughly, to 1860s, uh, that, that killed off about 90% of California's Indians. Uh, and they had lost all of their land, but they are now in a position to regain uh, management rights over something like 100 square miles of land in, um, in lower central California. Uh, in partnership with a number of federal agencies, land trusts, and so on. And what they're doing, they realized that, that they had lost the, they had lost the, uh, the, the cultural knowledge, land management skills that they now hope to use to kind of restore all of this land. And so they are now busy researching, you know, they're, they're going into the, the libraries, they're talking to all the experts they could find to try to restore this, this knowledge. And, and lo and behold, E.K. Kalsa, you see on the lower left, was our good friend and, uh, and colleague on the Conservation Law Foundation, uh, Massachusetts board, until what, a year ago? And he left for California, and he's now the head of the Alma Mutsen Land Trust. So uh, there are connections. Anyway, that's a picture on the left of the area that they have uh, made a Alma Mudson Land Trust stewardship area, you know, through all of these partnerships. It's, it's, it's a pretty cool uh, prospect, and they're among the other, uh, some of the things they're doing are prescribed burns, uh, which was common in California. And then uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Bears Ears situation. It, uh, uh, as, as a result of Many, many years of, of planning and work by a multi an intertribal coalition of at least 25 tribes. The, the, the Bears Ears Monument was uh, designated by the Obama administration a few years ago and then uh, now has been broken up and from 1.3 million acres is down to less than 300,000 acres in two separate blocks. So it's even worse than just reduce, reduced, it's been broken up. And you know, when you look at the potential for responding to climate change, uh, the last thing you want to do is break up you know, big parcels of land that is accessible to and used by and managed by um, uh, native groups. But that's what's happened. And I know there, there are going to be continuing efforts to try to remedy the situation. And there are other monuments that have been decimated just as well. You know. uh, so. Uh, now, looking at New England, I don't want to take too much longer, but quickly I'll go through. You might be aware of the uh, Penobscot Nation, which is located, uh, focused at Indian Island, where their principal reservation is, but they are basically in control of something like 225 islands uh, along the Penobscot River. And the issue there has been that recently, the, uh, the state has uh, fought the tribe, uh, the Penobscot Nation, over the right to control water quality and to conduct um, uh, subsistence fishing on the river. And af af after years of paper uh, production and other, other industrial uses of, of the Penobscot, which is a huge, has a huge watershed, uh, the, the, the river water quality has been degraded to the point where for years there has been an extreme restriction on subsistence fishing. I mean, pregnant women are not allowed to touch that water. It's that bad. Uh, a few people can fish. But uh, on the positive side, the, uh, the tribe has been uh, very active uh, in, in coordinating a river restoration project that has um, involved the removal of two of the major dams, allowing the Atlantic salmon to come up again, and the construction of a passageway around a third dam. Uh, but is the, the tribe is still in court against Janet Mills, who was the attorney general and is now governor, uh, over their right to control the river. So, and here's the the uh, the main Indian. Uh, Indian Land Settlement Act passed, I think, in 1980, and one of the things it did was 
uh, allow the restoration to the Penobscot of something like 20,000 acres of land, which is under the management of their natural resources department. John Banks was down at one of our symposia a few years ago. He runs the Penobscot Natural Resources um, section, and he's doing amazing work. They all are. I mean, there, there, is, there are so many uh, neat projects going on. <clears throat> and here's a picture of, of the river. And then um, as, as part of the, the uh, struggle over rights to the river, uh, a Justice for the River conference was held a few years ago up, up in, uh, at Indian Island, and uh, a, a lot of local support has come out, but, but the, the case is still up in the air. Kirk, Kirk Francis is the uh, um, tribal leader and if you get a chance, go online and, and look at uh, the Indigenous um, Climate Network website and go on to Kirk Francis's talk. Uh, he, he talks for an hour about the recent history of the Penobscot situation. It's, it's, it's really a must. You, you, should, you should listen to it. There are other issues going on with the Penobscot. The control of the river and water quality, okay, uh, the dams. Uh, contamination, the east-west corridor, I won't belabor that one, but there, I think there's still up in the air uh, a, a, a plan to bisect the state with this massive corridor that will probably, would probably be used for not only transportation but pipelines. Uh, landfill expansion next door, so a lot going on. So uh, let me quickly uh, talk about the, the efforts of the uh, Nipmuc and also the Chappaquiddick Wampanoag to recover land. So here's a picture of Martha's Vineyard. On the, on the uh, left end is the Aquina, Gay, Gayhead Aquina uh, part of the, um, uh, the Wampanoag tribe, uh, Wampanoag Nation. Uh, they control something like 500 acres on that end, but at the other end, the Chappaquiddick, which used to um, uh, inhabit and use all of the Chappaquiddick Island, uh, are, are, are down, they're landless now, uh, for, you know, uh, as, partly as a result of the reservations being disestablished in that uh, 1869 um, legislation. So the question is, here, here's Gay Head, that's the Aquina, and that's a recognized, a federally recognized tribe. Uh, that's part of their holdings. And out on the uh, west part of the island is the Aquina Cultural Center, a really important historical uh, repository that uh, people, people ought to visit. Linda Coombs is the curator, and she's just a, a terrific resource. Um, and then, so here's Chappaquiddick, and as you probably know, it's been almost completely taken over by a combination of uh, wealthy white folks who have bought up very expensive land, and, uh, and, and fragments that are owned by the, uh, the Martha's Vineyard Land Bank. So that's conserved land, but it's not available to native tribes, uh, not available to the Chappaquiddick yet. Uh, and I have a picture. Okay, so uh, one of the things you ought to know is that both the Nipmuc and the Chappaquiddick Wampanoag have not been successful in achieving federal recognition. After years and years, the Nipmuc were turned down in 2007. And uh, this is the this this petition is the product of I mentioned Nicole Friedrichs. Uh, she and others have have uh, petitioned uh, the United Nations Working Group to see if they can get assistance in achieving recognition. Here is the, so after the, the reservation lands were, uh, as you can see up on the upper, upper picture, the reservation lands of the Chappaquiddick uh, Island were amounted to two separate uh, areas. And uh, ap after 1869, uh, the, the reservations were uh, no longer in the hands of the Chappaquiddick. So the tribe dissipated, it, 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 uh, its residents are scattered, 
And so the question comes, how can they all, there is a burial ground that uh, the Chappaquiddick have on the island, but really no other land. So here is the current land ownership, and there are possibilities for working with either the town or the town of Edgartown or the, uh, or the Sheriff's Meadow Foundation, which is a, a land trust, or possibly with the land bank, although they've been resistant up to now, to getting land back in the hands of the Chappaquiddick tribe. So back to this picture. Uh, so you can see the Nipmuc, former Nipmuc area that was quite large in, this, in the center of the picture. And the three and a half acres that is all that is left of their territory right now along the Blackstone River. And one thing we're working on uh, with Cheryl Holly is the possibility of uh, acquiring a 57-acre parcel that the town has deemed owner unknown and is kind of uh, uh, accruing back taxes. So the question comes, can the town legally put this back where it belongs in the hands of the Nipmuc Nation. It was actually, a deed was never created. It was never sold to white folks. So it sits there and would be uh, a very nice uh, kind of base for operations. It's certainly not casino territory. It is, it is uh, largely wetlands. It's right in the Blackstone River. So it's a work in progress, and we heard from, uh, well, it, it turns out that uh, the town, in order to convey this to the Nipmuc, needs uh, approval from the Department of Revenue. So as of right now, we're working on that. Uh, I know Cheryl was in touch with uh, DOR and is, is uh, getting, the help, getting help from Jim Peters, who's the Executive Director of the Commission on Indian Affairs for the state. So we'll see where that goes. Here's part of the land. Okay, so are, how are we for time? Few, five more minutes? Okay, so just quickly a look at the, uh, the territory that the Eastern Cree uh, up on the east side of James Bay have been using for thousands of years. We were, uh, I think I mentioned we visited Last year with six students, Paul Barton has been from UMass Forestry, has been running trips up there for 10 years and has developed a, a terrific course that, uh, thanks to uh, the Bosom family in Ujibugamu, one of the villages up there, has uh, been, uh, been in a position to expose students to uh, subsistence living and the hunting camp uh, life that many Crees still uh, are engaged in. Here's Paul with, with the six students. Anna Bosom is on the left, and she and her husband uh, have been uh, really, really active politically up there because one of the things that the, the Cree have dealt with is the massive Hydro-Quebec project you might be familiar with. So starting in the, the 1940s, dams began to be put in for electric power. These were private dams. Uh, in uh, much of this country, and we're talking way north of, um, of Montreal. I mean, it's a 16-hour drive from Massachusetts, so we're way up north. And then uh, in 1970, the uh, Canadian government nationalized all of these power sources and came up with a massive new project, which they've forced the Cree to accept. I mean, the Cree got certain benefits, but the Le Grand River was uh, dammed in three places, and then future development, hydroelectric development, has involved many more dams. Uh, you know, despite very serious resistance from the Cree and, and their allies. So here are the, and that that shows we're, we're right about in the middle of the picture with James Bay on the on the left, and then uh, the 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 various villages of the Cree east of, of James Bay, and they were all required to vote on the, uh, uh, in 2002, the, the third phase. They were able to, to turn back the Great Whale Project with help from U.S. environmental groups, but the, great, the, um, the Rupert River dams went forward, uh, 
as a result of um, a lot of squeezing that, that the, the, the Hydro-Quebec, you know, the Canadian government did, uh, pretty much forcing the Cree to accept, okay, 4.5 billion went to, over a period of 50 years, was promised to the Cree. But on the other hand, the, the effects on local life there has, have been dramatic. I mean, when you look at these giant rivers that have been dammed and, and then the, the encroaching, the encroaching of uh, thousands and thousands of workers coming in to build these structures, uh, clashing with local culture. Uh, we got a really good look at, um, at, at the day-to-day -day life of the Cree folks up there. Here is Anna preparing a moose hide, which is an arduous process. Uh, they brought in, the, the family brought in four moose while we were there. We went out on their fishing line. Uh, they set up uh, the underground, you know, underwater, under ice nets uh, and brought in quite a few fish. But this is really skilled uh, work that has developed, you know, the science uh, around this fishing culture has, has developed over, you know, in a trial and error way over thousands of years. So we were privileged to be able to be part of that for a very short time. And then I, I think this is the last picture, but, but you should be aware of the Northeast Indigenous Climate Resilience Network. And if you go on the website, uh, you'll see some really fascinating presentations by uh, representatives of lots of these uh, tribes that are doing very interesting projects um, related to climate change. And then, of course, there are international discussions around climate change. So I will stop there. Thank you, Pete, for a very interesting talk. I guess I'll start with a um, two or three part question. Um, as someone who didn't grow up here, so I, I don't, my knowledge is limited. And the first part of my question is, what is the current size and geographical distribution of the Massachusetts tribes, given that they are essentially landless? And the second part of the question is, has anybody looked at the uh, traditional knowledge uh, and cultural loss due to the fact that they are landless? And what is the status nowadays and what is the prospect? Yeah, I think the prospects are, are really positive, are really hopeful in, in the sense that even though uh, the first part of your question, most of these groups have, have been scattered. You know, so the Chappaquiddick Wampanoag uh, has members that are all over the country. Uh, Alma Gordon happens to live in Connecticut. Others live as far south as you know the the Deep South or or out west. And then uh, and and about 20 years ago, uh, a few key people who are who discovered there that there are you know wide-ranging members of the tribe out there have been assembling for periodic gatherings, uh, the Chappaquiddick group. And uh, I think as time goes by, they are coalescing around some, uh, some very important projects. Uh, the Mashpee Wampanoag, uh, I don't know whether any of you have been to their headquarters, but they have a, a really uh, impressive uh, corporate structure and a lot of commercial activity going on and you should know, I mean, these, this is true of, of many, many tribes around the country. Uh, that it, You think casino, but there are tribes with lots of, you know, forestry things going on, uh, lots of other commercial activities. Uh, the casinos themselves are extremely valuable in providing funding that spins off other commercial activity. So this isn't what, exactly what you've been asking about, but uh, it's it's a mixed picture. I mean, you see lots of lots of small groups. The Herring Pond Wapanoag group uh, is also scattered, but they are you know they have uh, routine meetings and they are coalescing around various projects. So I think there there is a lot of potential there. Yeah, thank you for a really interesting talk. I was thinking about this landless notion in the West. 
there's an awful lot of federally owned land that it seems to me that that could, with sufficient political power, get flipped to help those communities. In the East, we also have no federally owned land. And so yeah. you, you mentioned the Nature Conservancy a couple of times, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about the relationship between these NGOs and the Indian um, various communities in terms of, is that their ticket, their mechanism for getting land is to work work with Nature Conservancy and other NGOs, or what are the other possibilities in the East? It's one of many different different possibilities. There's a book you ought to, ought to know about if you're really interested in, in the land picture, and that's, uh, it's called Trust in the Land, and it's by Beth Rose Middleton, who was at the university, or is at the University of Santa Barbara, but what she does is take case by case uh, around, much, much of it is in the West, uh, a picture of partnerships among yeah, Nature Conservancy, Trust for Public Land, but with, 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 the, with the real driving force being the tribes themselves, you know. So how, how to fashion these coalitions that, that make things happen. And as far as I know, Trust for Public Land has backed off of its, it, it had a very serious initiative and helped a, a good bit with some of these things out there, you know, some of these projects. I'm not sure they're doing that now, and I'm not sure how active Nature Conservancy is either, but uh, you were also seeing the rise of native-run uh, land trusts. You know, that's happening in many places. So, yeah. So my question, which is both to you and also to all of us, is Trust, Trust is, of course, a large landowner in Grafton, Massachusetts, which is the homeland of the Nipmuc Nation. Yep. And we have to ask the question, we have a lot of lands that are in agricultural use in that area, or in sort of varying stages of conservation in that area, um, what are the possibilities for Tufts to engage in a cultural, cultural respect agreement for those lands? What, yeah. what, what are your recommendations? Who should, who should be involved? Who should? Yeah, well, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned to uh, Ninian's class uh, the, the Brown University situation. Uh, you know, as you may know, Brown was given, I think, a few hundred acres in the town of Bristol, which is not, not far from Providence. Uh, and uh, the, the Pocono group, Pocanoka, sorry, group uh, was uh, felt that, that that was part of their homeland and needed to be conveyed to them. They were afraid Brown was going to sell it. I'm sorry? They were afraid Brown was going to sell it. So yeah. just to fill in the... Sorry. <laughs> I know a lot about this case. So yes, Brown yes. had been donated the Hoffman Refer estate on which they had built a museum. And the museum buildings had gotten too old they had fallen out of code, and they were told they could not have gatherings of more than five people on the museum land, in, in the museum itself. So there was still a retreat center and a large holding of land of, in the heart of the Poconocet homeland, which had yeah. specifically yeah. been given to the university to keep it out of the hands of tribal, out of the hands of not tribal members, out of the hands of developers, to keep it, because the view was the university would protect it for the tribe. But the tribe rightfully feared that the university trying to make funds no longer able to run the muse physical museum buildings on there was essentially using it to warehouse artifacts. And the fear was that the university would decide to sell this beautiful and highly valuable but enormously culturally significant right. um, property. Right, right, right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, and then the upshot was that after a lot of pressure from the tribe, the land was conveyed along with the land preservation trust uh, apparatus to the Poconoka. So they now have that, that base there. Thank goodness, Brown did the right thing yeah. with a yeah. lot, with a, yeah. with a literal yeah. uh, camp in to a yeah. lot, lot of pressure to change. Yeah, and more, and more broadly, I mean, there are, there are, uh, there, there is the potential for gift land to come to uh, tribal control. Uh, I, I'm aware of one piece in Canton, Mass, at the end of the Blue Hills Reservation that was actually conveyed by the state to the tribes. Uh, the State Division of Capital Asset Management, DCAM. Uh, has been approached, and I'm not sure they have actually conveyed land, but you know there. But but you can't rely on on that kind of uh, you know generosity from from state and federal government. There there have to be uh, other mechanisms that are, are are going to be more likely to succeed. Yeah, did you have? Yes, uh, really fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, in, in a previous life, I, I was an indigenous rights lawyer, and and so I've. A couple of cases that get haunt up me. here. <laughs> no, 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 no. But a couple of cases that haunt me, and I wonder what you think about them. Um, one, you were talking um, 
about Penobscot, but I, I worked with uh, Pastor McQuaddy, and yeah. the issue of taking down dams was very divisive within the community because um, different bands had different ideas. Uh, one that wanted to restore the, the natural flow and the, the run of the alewives and so on, yeah. and others who had been become um, fishing guides in some of the lakes that were created. Another case in, in, um, in Panama where they were building a hydroelectric dam, a very large one, well, building dozens of them actually, but in one particular one that we were focused on, um, where, where some of the communities thought this is terrible, uh, would literally be flooded out and um, be forced into much worse lives, what, whereas others thought maybe this would bring economic development and this could be helpful. Sure. Yeah. How do you navigate something yeah. like that? And, you know, where you have, uh, you know, it's, it's easy when you can see this will definitely have a, a terrible effect on everyone in the community. Yeah. But when there's, when there's a possibility maybe for economic development or when there's, for whatever reasons, uh, difference of opinion with the, in the community, what do you do with that? Yeah, that, well, that, that's a good point. I'm not sure I'm in a position to, to answer that, but you can see what the, what the dilemma often is. And just, I mean, you mentioned your background. I hope that this forum will bring indigenous people in. So, I mean, I don't want to be in a position of being a spokesman for indigenous groups by any means. I'm privileged to be able to work with some of them, but uh, I, I have attended a couple of symposia, uh, one at Radcliffe and one at Harvard over the last couple of years on indigenous law. And one of the things that came out was that Harvard University has zero indigenous, full-time indigenous faculty members. I mean, think about it. Uh, so I hope things will, will begin to change, but there are, there are some terrific uh, resource people who are experts in indigenous law uh, out there, and I hope you'll be in touch with them. <laughs> Thank you. Any? Any other questions? All right, let's thank Pete Whistler one more time. Okay, thank you very much.